Welcome to our service this morning. As you know and as you've heard, we are starting a new series on the book of Proverbs. It's called Ancient Wisdom for a Modern World. Today, as we said, will be Wisdom Knows Best. Proverbs, something we don't often talk about, but we know about it. When we think about a proverb, we think about wisdom that is given to us in a small nugget. And when we hear it, we recognize it. It kind of intuitively we recognize that it's wise and it's true. So it speaks to us in that way. I want to just uh, remind you of a few. The first one is called a closed mouth catches no flies. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is a new one for you. Well, this proverb has had two different interpretations. Some people say this refers to a frog. A frog that sits with a closed mouth will never catch any flies. The frog has to open its mouth. Its tongue has to go out. It has to grab a fly before it will eat. So if the frog doesn't open its mouth, it's not going to eat. And that means that you can't just sit on your behind. You've got to get up and do stuff. The second interpretation of this proverb is that when people speak and when they talk a lot of nonsense, and especially when they gossip or they talk about other people, they often get into trouble. So the mouth that stays closed, the person that does not engage in that kind of gossip and idle talk, that person won't get any flies in their mouth. So they will stay safe and they will be okay. There's a second proverb, one that I know that you've heard before. Maybe you can finish this up for us. A something in the something is worth something in the something. I guess most of you know. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. And it simply means that if something is certain, it is more valuable than something that is only possible. Even if the certainty has lesser value than the possibility. So if I'm certain that I have one bird in my hand, it's worth more than the possibility of having two, but they're not in my hand, they're in the bush. These are common day proverbs that we use all the time. And when we come to study the book of Proverbs, we are going to be reaching out to ancient Proverbs, but that are applicable for us today. They are very helpful for us. Now, the first thing I want to say about Proverbs is that these Proverbs um, are wisdom spoken by people who are very wise. These Proverbs are spoken by people who have observed life. And as they've observed life and as they've learned from their experiences, they've brought those together into Proverbs and they made them accessible to us. So this uh, wisdom then is accessible not just to Christians, but to all people around the world. It doesn't matter what nation you're from, it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter what religion you, you are believing in, but these are accessible to you. So as we said, these resonate to us because we intuitively know that they're true when we hear them. But here's the thing. They are generally true. They are not always true. When we think about something that is generally true but not always true. You could think about something like honesty is the best policy, which is a proverb that we all know. And we all know that generally it is true that it's better for us to be honest. But it's not always true. So if you think back to the Second World War, for instance, where uh, Jews were hiding from the Nazi Germans and if you were someone that was hiding a Jew in your house, maybe downstairs in the basement, and if a soldier came to the door and they asked you straight up, 
Are you harboring any Jews? Are you hiding anyone? In that instance, you don't want to be honest. Even though honesty is generally the best policy, in that instance, you are not going to be honest. You're going to say, no, we don't have anyone. For guys, let me give you some advice. Honesty is the best policy, but if your wife or your girlfriend puts on new clothes and she says, does this make my butt look big? That's the moment that you're going to say no. doesn't matter what you think. You're going to say no, it doesn't. If your wife or your girlfriend goes to the hairdresser and she comes back and she says, what do you think about my new haircut? Let me give you an advice. Whatever you think, in that moment, you're going to say, it looks great. I love it. Honesty is generally the best policy, but, but not always. And that's the way that wisdom is, and that's the way that Proverbs are. It is generally true, but not 100%. And we need to know that. The second thing we need to know is that some of the Proverbs can be contradictory and we need wisdom to know the difference between them. The proverb we know, it says, more haste, less speed. Means the more you are frantic, the less you actually get done. But it seems to be contradictory to the proverb that says, he who hesitates is lost. So sometimes you need to move quickly, and sometimes you need to move, move more slowly. And it needs, you need wisdom to know the difference between the two. Which proverb needs to be applied at which time? But yes, here are two things I actually want to place before you as we start, start thinking about Proverbs. How to interpret them, how to think about them. The first thing is that they are a proverb, as we already said, they are not a promise. Many times I find that people think about these as promises from God. And they, they take these Proverbs and they believe them and they pray for them as if this has been a promise from God. I will give you an example. There's a proverb that says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. So people take that, and maybe they start a new business, and they commit that business to the Lord, and they said, well, now this business will be successful. Because the proverb says, whatever... I now do will succeed because I've committed my plans to the Lord. But that wasn't a promise that God gave. You see, when God gives a promise, He stands behind the promise. He guarantees that what He has promised will come true. A promise is something that you can rely on 100% of the time. But a proverb is different. It was never given by God as a promise. It is generally true, and it is always helpful, but it's not something that God is guaranteeing to work out. Another example is when people say, uh, I take this, this uh, proverb which says, train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. People take that promise and they, they say, well, this means that if I take my kids to Sunday school and if I train them up, I take them to church, that means that they will become a Christian or they will stay a Christian. Or even if they fall away, they will come back to God and be a Christian. This is something that is guaranteed, is promised by God. But it's not a promise. It's a proverb. And it is generally true. Generally, the way that people learn about life as they grow up and as they are trained at home is generally the way that they live their lives. So the first thing we need to know is that it's a proverb, it is not a promise. And that's going to help us as we interpret these proverbs that we will be reading. We should not take them out of context. This is not a book of promises, this is a book of proverbs. So that's our, our, our big 
um, context that we have as we interpret. The second thing that's important to know is that these are poetic. In the Hebrew Bible, of course, po Hebrew poetry always has two lines, and they work together. Now, these lines will work together in uh, four different ways. Firstly, it will be a synonymous parallel, a, which is a double um, parallelism, and the word and will be in there. There will be one line, and then and, and a second line. And that tells you that these two are um, synonyms, and they're working together. Now, what's great about poetry, and what is great about this parallelism, is that it's easy to remember. It sticks in your mind. We say, a stitch in time saves nine. It just flows so easily for us. It's not a stitch in time saves 27. Or a stitch in time saves 115. A stitch in time saves nine. That just sticks in your mind. Now for us, when we come to the Proverbs, we read them in English, of course, and they don't flow in the same way for us. But for a Hebrew person, they would flow like that. Easy to remember. The second is an antithetic parallelism, which is the opposite. This on the one hand, but this on the other hand. And in those kind of par parallelisms, we'll see the word but that connects them. The first one was and. This one is but. And in the third one is a synthetic parallelism which advances a thought, and that word that connects them is called for. So, there'll be one line, and they'll say for, and then there'll be the second line. And that advances the thought of the first line. It just takes it a little bit further. And then, of course, the fourth one is acrostics. And we're all familiar with acrostics, where you could take the alphabet, A to Z, and you can start each new line with a new letter of the alphabet. A, B, C, D, and so forth. 26 different lines, each one starting with a new letter of the alphabet. This is what happens here in Proverbs 31. We know that Proverbs 31 is so famous because it speaks about the noble woman, the wonderful wife. And Proverbs 31 is an acrostic. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet, and each line starts with a new letter. So, these are the ways then in which these Proverbs are poetic. Poetic for us, easy to remember, easy to see, and there's a beauty about them that strikes us. One of the things that people often think about when they think about Proverbs is people think about the words of God and the words of men. Now, when we read Proverbs, we know that this is part of the Word of God. And I'm going to just look at um, the Scripture there in 2 Timothy, where Paul writes, and he says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Proverbs, then, is written and is useful for us for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness, for all those things. The Proverbs has been written by wise people about life, giving us advice how to live life well. If we pay attention to that, we will see how good, it, how good we can live life. And it is God-breathed, but it's not a direct word from God like we have in the prophecies, for instance, where the prophet would stand up and say, Thus says the Lord. And then you have word for word what God is saying to His people. Or, like in the law, where it says, These are the laws. You shall love the Lord your God. You shall serve the Lord your God only. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. These are the laws. And this is what you have to abide by. Proverbs is different in that sense. It's a reflection by people about life. Now, these are very wise people, of course, and so what we read from them is going to help us 
as we think about life and what we read from them will be useful for these things, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. With all that said, let us get to today's passage. Proverbs 1, I'm reading from verse 1 to 7, and this will be from the NIV. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these wise men who wrote these things down for us many, many years ago. This is part of ancient wisdom, but this is also applicable for us living in a modern world. Lord, I thank you that these wise words will be helpful for us to correct us, to teach us, to train us in righteousness, in righteous living, in bringing honor to you and in living life well. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would speak to us and draw us closer to you and draw us closer to the truth and the wisdom that is freely available to us in Jesus Christ. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Well, the first question we can ask is why were these proverbs written down? And Solomon, who is the, the author of this book and the compiler of this book, because it's not only everything that he said, but he also compiled wisdom from other people, bringing it together, making it accessible. He gives us a, the reasons in the very first verses. In verses 2 to 6, we read this. It is for gaining wisdom and instruction. That's the first reason. These Proverbs were written down so that we can gain wisdom and instruction, so that we can understand words of insight. Secondly, it is for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, so that we can do what is right and just and fair. You see, these Proverbs are there for us so that we can learn to live in a way that is morally good, in a way that is just and fair, and right. It's not just wisdom to know a lot of stuff, but it's wisdom to know how to lead a good life. So the wisdom that God gives in this book to us is wisdom that helps us in a moral way. Thirdly, it is for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Two people there that we are reminded of the young and the simple if you're not very smart if you are a simple person this is going to help you if you are a young person and you need to learn about life this is going to help you but he goes on he says let the wise listen and add to their learning it's not just for the simple and for the young it is also for the wise and those people who are wise already, they will be able to look at these Proverbs, to meditate on them and to learn from them, and they will add to their learning. Those who are wise will become wiser still. Four, understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. It is for those who want to understand the Proverbs, who understand these riddles that the wise speak. Sometimes these people give pronouncements that we know are very smart and very wise, but we don't fully understand what they say. 
So these are the, are the reasons why Proverbs was written for us. We get to the thematic verse, of course, which is verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The same verse is repeated very similarly in chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord, when we see that Lord written there in four capital letters, L-O-R-D, we know that behind that, in the Hebrew, is a tetragrammaton, the four letters of God's holy name. Y-H-W-H. Most people say that stands for Yahweh. It is the name that God Himself gave to Moses when He revealed Himself to Moses at the burning bush in the book of Exodus. We read about that. He says, I am that I am. That is my name. God's covenant name, Yahweh. It is about this God, this Yahweh God, not any other God. The fear of this God is the beginning of wisdom. Do we say fear? Yes, fear. In the Old Testament, it says that the fear, the, in Deuteronomy, it says, fear the Lord your God and serve Him only. Yes, fear Him and serve Him. In the New Testament, Jesus is speaking and He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. The rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is the one you should be afraid of. This is the one who can destroy both body and soul. If there is anything or anyone in all of creation that should be feared, it is this person, this God, who has this kind of power. Fear Him, but also love Him. In the Old Testament, it also says, in Deuteronomy, the same book and another verse, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. The same God that you should fear is the same God that you should love. Those two emotions... Fear and love, those two responses, those two heart attitudes will be centered on the same person, this God, this Creator God, who is above all. Professor Bruce Walke said, Fear and love go together for God's people. They believe His promises and love Him. They believe His threats and fear Him. They believe His promises and they love Him, and they believe His threats and they fear Him. They go together. In the Chronicles of Narnia, the children walk through a wardrobe into a fantasy world. In this world, Christ is represented by Aslan, the great lion. When the beaver tells the children about the lion, the children ask, Is he safe? Of course not, the beaver answers. He's not safe, but he is good. Our God is a God who is not safe, but he is good. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, when we think about beginning, it can be a foundation or it can be about a point in time. When you think about a point in time, like January 1 is the beginning of the year, it's very helpful for you when the year begins, but when you get to May or June or July, it's in the rearview mirror. You don't really care about January 1 anymore. It has no influence on what you're doing today. 
But when you begin to build a building, you start with a foundation. And that foundation of the building will be very relevant to the health of, of that building, the structural integrity of that building forever and ever, as long as that building is going to stand there and, and remain there. See, that's a different beginning. Now, when we think about the fear of God as the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom here is a beginning that is both. It's a point in time, but it's also something that is going to endure. I want you to think about the way or the place that a river would begin. A river begins at its source. There's a fountain or there's a glacier that's melting and the river begins. It's a point in time. It's a specific place where it starts. But that water that comes from that uh, fountain is going to flow through the whole river right to the end. That's how the wisdom of God is. It comes from Him. He is the source. He is the fountain of all wisdom. But it's not just going to come to you one point in time. It's going to come to you again and again and again like the river that flows. If the fountain stops, if the glacier has already melted and there's no more water, the river is going to run dry. So the beginning of the river and the water that you find further on are intimately connected. And that is how God and wisdom is. When we fear God and we love God and we start to enter into the wisdom of God, it will always come from Him, but it will reach us wherever we are and it will be intimately connected to us wherever we stand in that river downstream. You are on the road to wisdom when you realize that this God is to be feared more than any other God. That this God holds life and death in His hands. That this God is the only one that is all-knowing and all-wise. It is wisdom to know who God is and who we are. Know your God. Know yourself. That is all. Wisdom is something that will reward you. There is great reward in wisdom. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. This is the father instructing his, his son, and he says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom, and she will protect you. Love her, and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. Cherish her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. There is so much benefit that comes from wisdom. But this is going to cost you. This is not going to fall in your lap. Wisdom is available to everyone. She is standing in the street and she is calling to everyone who will listen. Old or young, smart or stupid. Come and learn from me. And I will help you. Come and learn from me and I will give you great benefits. The father is telling his son, even though it costs you everything, seek wisdom. Even if it costs all the money you have, get wisdom. Because the value of wisdom will be so much more than the value of the money that you have. The value of wisdom will be so much more than any other property you might have. The value of wisdom is supreme. For us as human beings, if we seek wisdom, and we seek it, 
as if seeking after something that is so valuable. God is going to bless us. When Solomon came before God and he was praying about thinking about becoming king one day, God spoke to him. God said, Solomon, you will be king one day and you can ask anything you want and I'm going to bless you. And the one thing he asked for is wisdom. And God said, because you didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for fame, you didn't ask for any of these other things, but you asked for wisdom, I'm going to bless you with all these other blessings. You see, it was so important to God and it was so pleasing to God that he was asking for wisdom, that God blessed him with everything. I'm going to close with this. The question for us is, yes, wisdom is great, but how do we get it? How do we seek wisdom? Well, first of all, in James, it says this. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The first way to seek wisdom is to pray. To ask God. Because God will give generously to all without reproach. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you've done up to this point, but when you come before God and you come before Him honestly and you pray and you ask for wisdom, God will give you wisdom. But you pray with faith the prayer for wisdom. Secondly, is to read the Scriptures, like the book of Proverbs, because it contains God's wisdom. It is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correction. People don't like correction these days. People think correction is a bad thing. Correction is not rejection. Well, you're not being rejected when you are corrected. Correct a wise person and he will love you for it. Correct a fool and he's going to hate you for it. Read the scriptures. It contains God's wisdom. Thirdly, Meditate on God's law. David said, I meditate on your law day and night. Take these scriptures, these wisdoms that we can read, and meditate on them. Let them stay in your mind. Let them marinate there. Let them stay there and think about them as you go through your day. As you go to work. As you travel on the bus. As you sit at home and you're waiting for the, the cake to rise in the oven. Whatever your situation is, keep these thoughts in your mind and meditate on them. And they will inform you. And God's wisdom will become available for you in your life. Fourthly, seek instruction. Seek out teachers that are wise will be able to open up things for you, explain things for you. Seek them. And if you need to pay, then pay. But get the wisdom because it is going to benefit you. And then fifthly, heed wide counsel and be open to correction. So, talk to people that you know, people who are wise, people who maybe know more than you do, or people that will help you think through something. Speak to them as wise counsel. And as you talk to them, be open to correction. Don't just be defensive and just say, well, I, the way I think about it is right, and I'm not going to take that from you. This is my truth. You can have your truth. No. Be open. And let their wise counsel help you, and you will become wiser still. Five ways to pray, to read the scriptures, to meditate on God's law, to seek instruction, 
to heed wise counsel, be open to correction. Five different ways for us to seek wisdom. Though it costs everything you have, gain wisdom. It has great value. Let's pray. Father God, as we think about wisdom, so often we feel we lack wisdom. We can read in the scriptures about Solomon's wisdom and we think, wow, we could never be like that. But Lord, your word is encouraging us to seek wisdom and it's encouraging us to pray to you and to ask for wisdom. So my prayer this morning is that we will have a desire after wisdom. And I pray that you would bless us with wisdom. Wisdom that comes from you and that is life-giving. And I pray, Lord, that as you do that, I pray that we will become wise people. That we will grow wise before we grow old. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.